Um, okay, so for now, we'll just take this next caller. Caller, thank you for being patient with us. Tell us your name and where you're calling from. Yes, hi. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Afroz from New Jersey. Welcome back to the show. How are you, sir? What's Fine, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Rabbi. Alaikum salam, yeah. my brother. Uh, Rabbi, uh, the, the, the Christian Bible and the writings of early uh, church leaders, of nearly all church leaders, contain uh, anti-Semitism uh, passages, uh, anti-Semitic passages, then how should we view the present-day love of Jews by evangelical leaders? Uh, the question is, have they disowned all what was written by their leaders, philosophers, and, uh, the and the giants in theology? Did the Christian Bible contain anti-Semitic passages? Then how should we view the love of Jews shown by present-day evangelical Christian uh, leaders. So the question is, have they disowned, have they condemned all that was written by their leaders? Hmm. All the patristic writings, I mean all, were virtually uh, anti-Semitic. In fact, um, if, if people today in America, as an example, would, would repeat over what, what the church fathers said in Canada, they'd be thrown in prison. Really. Not in America, because America has free speech. But believe me, David Duke has nothing on the Church Fathers. Every one of them, from Ignatius all the way, the anti-Nicene Church Fathers, I mean, prior to the Council of Nicaea, Melito, we know the filthy that came from his, his dirty mouth. And I say to my <laughs> Muslim cousins, you have to give us a break. <laughs> because we were dealing with this abomination uh, <laughs> before, while still the Arabs were in, uh, uh, in Jahiliya, in, in ignorance. So for 600 years, we had to put up with this stuff. So give us a break. And I say it with love. Anyways, um, so the church fathers were all... V I, I, I don't mean that they were, you know, just didn't like Jews or thought that, you know, like Jews controls the banks and the media. <laughs> and by the way, I, I plead, that because we have all the left-wing Jews controlling the media, and they do. What the anti-Semitic is true, the, please, I ask the non-Jews, please take over the media, because the crazy left-wing Jews are destroying it all. So uh, let's get some non-Jews in the media so we can be free of all this stupidity. So the question is, how did things change if all the church fathers, and they were, the golden mouth piece of filth, Augustine, the Bishop of Hippo in his City of God, that pseudo-intellectual, he was Hippo was modern day Algeria. He despised Jews. Look, unless you take a lot of bonine and anti nausea drugs, you don't want to read it. It's terrible. Awful. Um, one just point it should be made that um, prior to 312, Prior to, let's say, the 4th century, church fathers can stand on the rooftops and scream their filthy drivel, and it was pure rhetorical, which means they can scream all they want, but Christians were not, Christianity was not only not a, a recognized religion in Rome, it was, they were considered 
they were considered in very low esteem and not recognized as a religion, and at times they were persecuted. So the key point is, prior to the fourth century, when only maybe 5% of Rome were Christians, okay, it, all the anti-Semitism, all this filth was rhetorical. It didn't mean anything. When Tertullian and Origen espoused all that dirt from their mouth about the Jewish people, they could talk all they want. It meant nothing. But after Nicaea, after Christianity becomes an official religion of the Roman Empire, so then when then, then when the church fathers call for synagogues to be burnt down and so on, and, 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 and so I don't want to go into it because I don't want to have to take Dramamine. But the point is, then it really mattered. Then it mattered. Incidentally, going into the, it's estimated that going into the fourth century, which means in the year 300, approximately, the estimates are 5% of the empire was Christian, estimate. By the time we, by the time the fourth century is ended, some 60% of the empire were Christians. I mean, this just gives you a sense of what's going on. And synagogues are burned down, so which means prior to Nicaea, the anti-Semitism was rhetorical, didn't affect us. Other things did, but not that. After Nicaea, it became it, synagogues burnt down. Life was was hell. I don't have no other word. It was hell for the Jews in Rome, not for the Jews in the Persian Empire. In the Sasanian Empire, life was great, and believe me, everybody knew. I don't want to go off topic. The question is, what happened? Why do we have today? Uh, evangelical Christians that are so pro-Israel. And I just want people to understand that I'm not saying everyone, okay? Not everyone, but it, it is Jewish people make a mistake, understandably so. There's a, what the church did to us, and I said we had a head start with the church before Islam. <laughs> so give us a break. We need the... But the key is what changed? So the first thing is that this, there are a number of contributing factors. Uh, the big, big, big one, big one, was a man who was born in the year 1800 in England. His name was John Nelson Darby. John Nelson Darby would travel to the United States and he had a new message. And this new message about the Jews, it's about the church, it's called premillennial dispensationalism. Dispensation means an economy, how many different, uh, how did God interact with mankind at different times? For some, But that's not germane to this point. We're going to just set that aside. The point that is germane to this show is that, that those who, he, first of all, he came to the United States and he spread these teachings and it spread like wildfire, wildfire. Now, America would be, in the 19th century, very receptive to this. Why? Because America had, there were had an affinity for Jews and Hebrew. In fact, it was even considered that Hebrew should be the official language. Look at Yale's logo. that has Hebrew in it. It was in. So the point was the preaching, the following is, this is the preaching of John Nelson Darby that caught on like wildfire. Now, with the help of many others, Cyrus Schofield, a lawmaker from Kansas, the key is I'm, I'm not going to deal with the, the, the economy of premillennial dispensationalism. I want to deal with only one feature of it that is germane to your question. And that is that he introduced, he said something that was very intriguing, which was 
incredible. He went back to the Jewish Bible, and he noticed that in the Jewish Bible it says that the covenant that God made with the Jewish people is unconditional, not because we're so great. Read Deuteronomy 7, verse 7, 6, 7, 8, 9. I didn't cast my love on you because you're so great. And blah, blah, blah. doesn't say that. He says, well, I made a promise to Avram. Anovi, Yitzhak, Anovi, Yaakov, Anovi, I made a covenant. I can't break that covenant. Can't break it. And therefore, I will always leave over a remnant. And even in the war, you see, notice I'm picking out the hardest passages. I'm not talking about the, the good, easy stuff. But we find in Tanakh all over that the covenant God made with Israel, with the Jewish people, the children of Yitzhak, and by the way, Yishmael. It's a miracle. It's amazing that the children of Ishmael, the Arabs, had a cov- have a covenant in Genesis 16, how they made it from the descendants of Ishmael that were completely went into a state of ignorance. And that they should maintain, they were complete pagans, but they maintained the tradition that the, the children of Ishmael was unbelievable. And to this day, we're the only two biblical nations that are among us. So... Miracles and miracles abound everywhere. But I want to stay focused on your question. So I'm going, I just, I want to make a point that premillennial dispensationalism means a lot. It has eschatological implications and so on. But I'm just going to focus in on one point. The key of his message that was adopted, it spread like wildfire throughout the United States and around the world is the following. That in fact, up until the point, this point, the church held that what's called replacement theology or uh, covenant theology or the theology of New Israel, a lot of names for it. Pre, uh, replacement theology is sort of the, it is the pedestrian term, is the term used conventionally. It means that the promises that God made to the children of Yitzhak and Yaakov, all the blessings that were given to the Jews has been replaced because the Jews killed Jesus, because they killed God. We committed deicide, so all the blessings, this is what was thought, that were originally given to the Jews, now the church is the new Israel. Therefore, the church is the heir to all the blessings that were given originally to the Jewish people. This was this is what was what was the gospel <laughs> of the church until this point. What John Nelson Darby is going to spread, and it's going to catch on, and there'll be others, the founder of, from everyone from the Red Cross to, it was everywhere. And important, it was a Schofield Bible that was published in the beginning, beginning of the 20th century that sold in the millions in America. It's a commentary using this teaching, and this would spread all over. And the key is, I want to stay focused, and that is that Star beheld that, in fact, God has two covenants, one with the physical seed of the Jews, that the Jews, the covenant that God made with the Jews cannot be undone, and that no matter how sinful they are, but there's always a remnant that will be faithful. Please read Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12 through 16. There's a remnant that are faithful, Please read it. And therefore, that remnant will be preserved and the covenant will be with them. And the the land, the holy land, not only the whole land, the whole world. The whole world belongs to who? Arabia doesn't belong to Arabs. And Israel doesn't belong to Jews. Kili kola aretz, the whole world belongs to me, meaning God. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the one who makes promises. Therefore, his message was that the Jews are chosen and that covenant is unbreakable. And in fact, it says it openly. You know, I want to send a message to Iran, to the mullahs and 
to the mullahs in Iran who are trying to destroy Israel, who are trying to murder the Jewish people, and are, in fact, they're, they're murdering far more Arabs than they are Jews, by far. It's, mamash, it's really crazy. They're killing fellow Muslims. Um, but Iran has the Shahab-3 missile that's aimed probably at the whole Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia and the land of Israel, and they're making a big mistake. And if you're part of, if you're a member of the of the uh, the the leadership of Iran, I appreciate if you switch channels because I don't want you to, well, maybe you'll repent, who knows. So they're, they're aiming the missiles that it, it, they want to kill the Jews. But the truth is, as Jeremiah 31 says, so says the Lord who created the sun to illuminate the day, day and the night, and the moon to illuminate uh, the sun to illuminate the day, and the, uh, and the sun and the stars and the moon to illuminate the night. If these laws should pass before me, so will the seed of Jacob. Uh, it means, if a ram wants to destroy the Jews, aim your missiles at the sun and the moon. If they'll be destroyed, then then Klal Yisrael, the children of Yitzchak and Yaakov, will be destroyed. It can't be done, because God made two covenants with the Bnei Yishmol and the Bnei Yitzchak. So, the key to the answer to your question is that this caught on like wildfire in the United States, and then it caught on in Europe, and so on and so forth, and that is, that means that the, co that means it, it, it opposes replacement theology, and that in fact, God has two covenants. One with the Jews, which cannot be broken. And the other one, and they're very pro israel because they believe that God owns all the world, the land belongs to him, and he gave, he loaned a part of the land to Israel, a part of the land to Moab, Ammon, Arabia, and so on. But God's the one who owns all the land, not us, not anybody, it says. But the key is that God does not break his, par his promise, as it says, the, the glory of God, of Israel does not lie, because he's not a man, he doesn't change his mind. So, therefore, this caught on big time all over America, it's all over Canada. There are other groups, like there are Anglicans who also hold this, but they actually believe there's one. I don't want to get complicated in this. But that's, now, naturally, here's the key point. If one believes that, um, that the blessings given to the Bnei Yitzhak, the Yaakov, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is still in force and can never be undone, and God will never break his word, and the word of God is forever and ever, right? God is not a man that he should lie. He's not a mortal who changes his mind, Numbers 23, 19. So therefore, God cannot break his promise with Israel, and replacement theology was rejected. Naturally, this would, of course, if Christians, meaning these premillennial dispensationalists who are coming from the Protestant church, and I'll explain why that's important, once you believe that God is still working with the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so then it naturally, in, in, it naturally, um, it, 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 it naturally would uh, in, in, enhance or it would convey a final Semitism, a love for Jews. And it's real. Jews are worried that evangelical Christians are only using their love for the Jewish people to convert Jews. Now, it, it is not correct. They really, really do love the Jewish people, believe that God gave the land of Israel to the Jews, and they have a great love for the Jews. It doesn't mean they, some of them don't use that affection to evangelize Jews, but I want to be honest, even though I'm very critical of Christianity, some Jews think that it's really they have an ulterior motive and that they're using it to convert Jews. I, have, I do not want to 
I'm not going to lie to you even though they're trying to convert you. I can't lie because I, I'm not, I don't appreciate that they support Jewish evangelism, which they almost always do. All of them do. In fact, all the missionaries, the Jews, uh, virtually come from this um, form of Christianity that is spreading like wildfire. There are probably 70 million Americans that embrace this uh, teaching. But they will, that means although, I want to make a point so everyone's clear. If these evangelicals believe that uh, not one Jew would convert to Christianity, they would still be pro, they would still support the Jewish people. And they would support uh, the covenant that God made with the Jewish people that the land of Eretz Israel would be assigned for them. They still would. But they use that in order to convey the fact that they're different than the old Christians because we love the Jewish people. They do because it naturally would, if the Jews, if replacement theology has been uh, jettisoned, right, and all the, this kind of anti-Semitism, which is the corollary of this, has been denuded, so then obviously, it would affect their view of the Jews. So it, it did make the change, but they're not connected. But many, the Jews for Jesus types, will use this support for Israel in order to witness the Jews and say, the old Christians, they were real Christians because they persecuted Jews. We are real Christians. We love the Jewish people, even though they can study Luther and so on and so forth. So that is the answer to the question of, why the change? That's the major, major shift. In fact, James Belfour, the Foreign Secretary of, of England, who was also the Prime Minister at one time, he held to this. He held to this theology and many, many others. Um, so that's the reason for it. Uh, that's what grew, and it's huge today. It's mega huge, okay? Now, the, the, the evangelical, the evangelical premillennial dispensationalists are more right-wing than the Prime Minister of Israel. <laughs> the BB, okay. Adon Olach, Asher Malach, B'terem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, בחף צוקו, אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא, ואחרי כפלות הכל, לבדו ימלוך נורא, והוא היה, והוא עובר. והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר בתפארה והוא עובר והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם אשר מלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחפץ הכל אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו ימלוך נורא והוא היה והוא עובר והוא עובד, והוא יהיה בתפארה. אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחץ הכל הזין מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נורא והוא היה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה. אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציר נברא לעת נשא וחץ הכל הזין מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי ככלות הכל לבדו עם נורא והוא היה והוא עובד בתפארה והוא עובד והוא יהיה בתפארה Thank you.
חפצ או קול אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא בחפצ הכל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי תכלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נועה והוא היה והוא הווה והוא יהיה בתפארה אדון עולם השם הלך בטרם כל יציא נברא לעת נשא בחפצ הכל אזי מלך שמו נקרא ואחרי תכלות הכל לבדו עם נוח נועה והוא היה והוא הווה בתפארה והוא הווה והוא יהיה בתפארה והוא היה והוא הווה בתפארה והוא הווה והוא יהיה בתפארה